In this module, we'll discuss what makes a study flawed. Flawed studies have similar but more severe problems than the unreliable studies. These problems can include selection or information bias, uncontrolled confounding influences, absent or poor dosimetry, poorly defined populations, incomplete participation and follow-up rates, and poor outcome determination. The weakest type of epidemiologic study, the correlation or ecological study, for example, can be well-designed, but because of inherent limitations, cannot provide information on radiation risks, and thus is flawed and unreliable. I'll provide two examples of flawed studies that should not be considered by regulators, decision makers, or managers when considering radiation protection guidelines. One is a Fukushima thyroid screening survey of children, and the other is an ecologic or geographical correlation study that I conducted on cancer risk around nuclear facilities in the United States. The Fukushima screening study was never intended to be a study. It was designed as a survey by the Japanese government to provide medical care and alleviate the anxiety of the population. It should be made clear that a survey is not a scientific study. In this survey, nearly 360,000 children were targeted for ultrasound screening of the thyroid. The effort backfired and created more anxiety and concern over health effects from the trivial radiation doses received by children and the public. Some took advantage of the screening effort to exaggerate the results and further mislead the public, as evidenced in this press release. A new study, should be survey, not study, says children living near the Fukushima nuclear meltdowns have been diagnosed with thyroid cancer at a rate 20 to 50 times that of children living elsewhere. This is an enormous risk. This difference, the authors contend, undermines the government position that more cases have been discovered in the area only because of stringent monitoring which they mean ultrasound screening of young children. It was known that screening hundreds of thousands of children would detect small thyroid tumors, none possibly related to radiation. But the government did not plan for the concerns that this would raise. And flawed investigations produced inappropriate and unbalanced interpretations. By the way, the study is published in the journal Epidemiology. It's an epidemiologic journal. Epidemiologists know about biases and peer review. Apparently, this slipped through the cracks. The study exemplifies screening bias, and the results are meaningless with regard to radiation risks. Radiation does cause thyroid cancer, but not shortly after exposure and screening is known to detect lumps and bumps and some micro cancers that would be found in any population that was similarly screened. Now here's an example of the effect of thyroid cancer screening in South Korea. Free ultrasound screening of the thyroid was introduced in 1993 and the incidence of thyroid cancer steadily rose. This illustrates the same situation as with the Fukushima screening. Small abnormalities are detected. There are no symptoms, but you now have to decide what to do. Perhaps perform a needle biopsy, and some of the pathologies will be small, indolent cancers. Population screening started in 1993 and continued, and the incidence of thyroid cancer increased. It looks like an epidemic of thyroid cancer. But what about mortality, death from thyroid cancer? It's flat. The thyroid abnormalities in asymptomatic people apparently were of no clinical significance. 
Although thyroid cancer doesn't carry a high mortality, given the huge increase in incidence, there should have been a concomitant increase in deaths. So this supports the World Health Organization and others who concluded that the apparent increase in thyroid cancer here and in Fukushima is an artifact due to screening and overdiagnosis. Interestingly, South Korea has reduced the population screening and the incidence of thyroid cancer has declined. So why is the Fukushima screening survey of children flawed? It was never designed or claimed to be a study. The reported risk is enormous. It would be the highest radiation risk of all time. The latency is too short. The thyroid cancers were detected less than four years after the Fukushima accident. Again, radiation causes thyroid cancer, but not the next day. It just doesn't happen. Even after Chernobyl, where children received very high doses to the thyroid over a gray, the increase in occurrence began five years after the accident. The modifying effect of aged exposure is not consistent with the world's literature. The highest risk was reported among teenagers who are at low risk of radiation-induced thyroid cancer. The lowest risk was seen among the young kids who were at highest risk of radiation-induced thyroid cancer. Prevalence of thyroid cancers and nodular disease was the same regardless of where you lived around Fukushima. The radioactive releases of concern were the radioactive iodines, which went whichever way the wind was blowing at the time. Thus, there were variations in the potential for exposure by region. Yet, there was no geographical variation in the prevalence of thyroid cancer. And screening of children in other cities where there was no radioactive contamination or potential for exposure found the same results. No matter where you screened, the results were the same. And there were no individual estimates of radiation dose to the thyroid from radioactive iodine, except for about 1,000 children where the doses were estimated to be negligible or incredibly small. Unlike Chernobyl, children did not drink any contaminated milk or food because the Japanese government prohibited such distribution. The possibility of a dose from inhalation was very small. With no to little potential for exposure, there is no potential for a radiation effect, particularly shortly after the accident occurred. Finally, these were surveys and they were not studies. These screening surveys were designed to provide reassurance. Studies are for science. A number of scientific committees recommended that these surveys shouldn't be conducted for the reasons discussed. Good intentions can lead to unanticipated outcomes that have needlessly raised anxieties and mental health issues among mothers. The last flawed study I'd like to mention is about cancer risk living near nuclear facilities. Remember that flawed in this context means that the study cannot contribute to establishing whether or not a radiation risk exists. This was a geographical correlation study, which is the least informative type of study. Complete disclosure. I directed the study, and yet I'm calling it flawed, even though it's, in my view, very well designed and conducted. We had the best people at the National Cancer Institute working on it. It was conducted because of interest in cancer clusters around some nuclear facilities in the United States and in the United Kingdom, and because Senator Kennedy asked the National Institutes of Health, NIH, if they would evaluate cancer risk around nuclear facilities in the United States. So, as government scientists, we conducted the study and then published the findings in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Somewhat surprisingly, this turned out to be my least scientifically valid study, but 
my most popular one, possibly due to the fact that 10% of the U.S. population lives in counties which have a nuclear facility. I gave many media interviews and NIH developed a professional video of me and my colleague, Seymour Jablon, that was widely distributed. Throughout, we emphasized that this was a correlation study, susceptible to many biases, and thus unreliable for determining radiation risk. You couldn't and shouldn't interpret the findings as to whether there was a cancer risk or not from living near a nuclear facility. The study might have provided some reassurance because a risk was not found, and this continues to be a conclusion from this study. The intrinsic nature of a correlation study makes it unreliable to test hypotheses, only useful to generate them. But then, it was not quite true that no risk was indicated. Childhood leukemia was slightly elevated. The relative risk was 1.03, or a 3% increase compared with other counties after the nuclear plants began operation. But because of the resources we had available to us, we could evaluate the risk for the population before the facilities began operation. That is, before there was any potential for radiation exposure. And the risk was higher. The relative risk was 1.08, or an 8% increase in childhood leukemia compared with non-exposed county populations. These time trends helped in the interpretation of the results. So, this is a well-designed study by experienced investigators who published in a high-impact journal. Nonetheless, the study is in the flawed category. The bottom line is, it's a correlation study. It does not have information on individuals living in the county study. There is no individual or even group dosimetry. There is just a correlation of cancer rates in people living in counties with a nuclear facility with people living in counties without a nuclear facility. To be able to make inferences, you must have individual dosimetry. Individuals may not have lived in an area long before dying there. They could have just moved there and died, and as a corollary, people living in the area for a long time may have moved. In these mortality studies based on large area or county rates, the investigators have no idea how long people live there. The numbers are large, but the absence of individual information on dose or confounding factors such as cigarette use tempers any conclusions that might be drawn. Correlation is not causation. These studies have value in generating hypotheses, but not testing hypotheses. They might be reassuring or not, but because of the inherent limitations in ecological studies, they are just not up to the task of providing meaningful estimates of radiation risk or in inferring causation.